If you didn't notice a theme in the songs today, I just want to tell you that not only has Jesus resurrected, but if you know Jesus, you're going to resurrect as well. Amen? You know, this Tennessee Southern boy, I said, sing, I'll fly away, because that's one thing we're going to do together one day. Amen? Amen. We're going to go back to glory. And it's all this suffering. The two years ago when that, what I just illustrated, I sat here and preached to Kevin and Andy and the rest of you online because we couldn't even gather. And look at us today. Huh? What the world said is go home, shut down, be fearful. And I get it. We needed to be because there was a lot going on. But Living Hope said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do some of the pictures you see on the screen. We're going to rebuild this building. We're going to re-roof this building. We're going to do outside church. We're going to do parking lot. Uh, ministries. We're going to see people come to Christ. We're going to gather when we can legally and put on masks. We're going to reach people in the, in the seats. We're going to allow people to know that they're served and we're going to wash their feet. We're going to do expanded kids ministry, expanded youth ministries. We're going to open a school and we don't have any money to build the school, but we're going to see God's hand. And he met all those things in the middle of the last two years. If we get busy staring at our bank accounts and our our things we can see and we're scared, the leaders in this church don't. All of you don't. We've been so blessed. We understand what living hope means. We understand that people need the message of the gospel. And no matter what suffering they're going through, whether physical, emotional, mental, that Jesus Christ is their answer. The world can't fix COVID situations. The world can't overcome pain and suffering. But when Jesus died on that cross and he yelled, to tell us that it is finished, it was done. And he faced the unknown. For those couple of days as he lied in the grave, as he's there, and and where's Jesus? What now is how we felt a few years ago? What's going to happen? And even today, what's going to happen, God? What's next? And we all need to come back to what is next. We all need to come back to, in our lives, do we know what's next? I challenge you this day, on this Easter Sunday, the resurrection day of Jesus Christ, that you understand where you're at in Him today. And that you reflect in your life that He's not a dead man. Because when He yelled, it is finished, He rose from that grave. He rose three days later. And today, if you believe that, Just how this church has overcome COVID, you can overcome your consequence. You can have life and you can have eternal life. And God can do the miraculous today in your life. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you're our living hope, Lord. And COVID and its challenges over the past two years have impacted us all. Lord, we've all faced down uncertainties. We've all had challenges. But Lord, through it all, Lord, you are victorious. And Lord, we claim your resurrection power in this place this day. That Lord, all glory to you. All honor to you. Lord Jesus, we love you and thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, may my words not be my own. May they be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. John 11, 25, Jesus said to Martha as he marched toward Lazarus. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And he says to her to calm her, he goes, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. An incredible statement. A statement that if you don't understand, you you could say, well, that's great. But what what was he saying? Jesus said the words that no person in that time of the Jewish people should have ever uttered. You see, in Exodus 3.14, we see God declare to Moses, I am who I am. It was such a holy name that the the followers of the Jewish faith, they would never say Yahweh. They would never say, I am who I am. They would never pronounce it. And if they wrote his name, one letter, they would throw the pen away. Next letter, they wrote it and threw it away to honor the holiness of that name. And along comes Jesus. And Jesus walks into that. And that kind of reverence. And you know what Jesus does? He says, I am. What? You want to know why they put Jesus on the cross? Yes, Lazarus. But also because Jesus declared with his own mouth what was blasphemous in his culture. He said, I am. Jesus Christ 
He said it first to the Samaritan woman. He goes, I'm, I am. And everyone who heard that was scared to death. And then we see in the book of John, he goes on to say it many more times. He says, I am the bread of life. Which means he provides what you need today. Don't look for the world for answers. Jesus is your answer for provision. Jesus says, Yahweh, I am the light of the world. He's the one that brings light to the dark places. He's the one that shines his light as this church has these last two years into darkness. And it's hope for people. He's also the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. He's the one that allows access. He's the one that allows the wolves to be stay outside of the fence so the wolves don't harm the sheep. He says, I'm the good shepherd. He's the one that when he is in pasture, he takes care. When, when we as sheep stray away, he comes to get us. He leaves the 99 for you. But he says also, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He makes an absolute statement. He's not a God that is a one... Uh, the only, he declares, I'm the only one. He says, there are many religions. There are many future people you may follow. But if you don't believe in me, you're not going to make it to the Father. He says, I'm the true vine. I'm the one that is your source. Don't look out for what the world can give. Make sure you're in me. Abide in me and I will abide in you. And then lastly, he says to Martha, as we stated in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The creator, the one who in Genesis 1.27 said, let us make man in our image. The plurality of God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The plurality of God is announced in Jesus becoming a man. When he stood on that cross and he had emptied himself by becoming obedient to death in Philippians 2, even death on a cross, he belittled himself down. To die a criminal's death, a humiliating death, as he lied on that cross naked. Not sort of naked, he was naked. He's on that cross and he can't breathe. And he's suffocating, his lungs are filling with water. And all that he had been through, his crown of thorns and everything, and the beatings in his face, he was so disfigured he looked like hamburger meat. But more than that, he's taking your sin upon himself. He's suffering the gravity of the COVID situation. He's taken death and a consequence in war and its injustice. He's taken all the pain and the disease, all the orphans, all the disjustice in the world, the unjust, the things of this world that are wrong and terrible. He's taken it into himself because he's the resurrection and the life. You must believe in him this day. You must believe in Christ to have life. It is your part today to believe he did that for you. He did all that for you. He did all that for you and you must believe it. You must fully believe it. The word believe is pisteo, which means Vine says it's to believe. I'm persuaded. I'm in a place of confidence. I absolutely trust. I have a sense of in my heart of complete reliance upon the credence of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one you must believe in. It's the most simple verse, verses in Scripture, but it's announced in football stadiums with signs. John 3, 16, For God so loved you. He loved this whole world that He gave His Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send His Son into the world to judge the world, but that through Him you might be saved. Amen? profound because it could have been that we had to earn it. It could have been that we had to be perfect. You see, I love our, the way we approach God at this church, our theology, theological stances. You can't save yourself. You're not good enough. These verses announce it. You must claim Jesus as your Savior. And then He works on your heart and helps you see that the world is not what you need. You must believe there are no conditions for his love, but your belief in the recognition that he died for you. I don't care how holy you are today. I hope you're living for Christ. I hope you're bringing credence to his name with your life. But I beg you to believe in his name today. And he will send the Holy Spirit into your heart and change your ways and change your life. And he will become the great I am to you. He will be the provision he announced in the book of John. He will meet your needs. And he loves you. You're his child. You know, the content of belief is important. 
we must absolutely understand Jonathan Whitfield. He was preaching to a group of coal miners in England once. And he asked one man, hey, sir, what do you believe? Well, I believe the same as the church, the guy said. And Whitfield replies, and what does the church believe? Well, they believe the same as me, he said. Seeing he was getting nowhere, Whitfield said, and what is it that you both believe? Well, I suppose the same thing. (laughs) That's kind of the lukewarmness, I think, sometimes of all of us, right? It's just this kind of like, yeah, I believe in God. and Church, we believe in God, and it's kind of the same thing. Does God, the belief in Him and the reality of what He's done for you, does it resonate in your life? If you could get a glimpse of eternity, whether heaven or hell, would it change your outcome? I mean, we've lived a couple of years of pretty bad stuff, right? If you don't know Christ today, I feel sorry for you, but I'm going to give you the opportunity to say yes, because Jesus, when He was on that cross, He had a thief on His right and a thief on His left. One cursed Him and said no, and one said You don't even deserve to be up here. And I believe you're who you say you are. Which thief are you today? Are you believing? Because Jesus looked at the thief that believed and he said, it's as easy as that. I'll see you in paradise. Amen? Amen? That's what belief is. It's saying, Jesus, I can't save myself. I deserve to be up here, said the thief. You don't deserve to be. Everyone else around him cursing, disciples hidden away, Jesus all alone, one thief talking to him. One thief. And he's up there with him, and he had woke up that morning, that thief, and he knew he was going to die. And he marches up on the cross, and he announces, you don't deserve to die. You did nothing. But Jesus, hearing that, said, you'll be with me. Is that you today, or are you rejecting Christ? Because Ephesians 2 says it looks like this. And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working, and the sons of disobedience. When you're without Christ, you're dead. You don't know. I recall my my son. My son Andrew is here today. He graduated from University of Washington in June. He graduates, but he finished two weeks ago. But he calls me one day and he says, hey, dad, it's fun in Seattle. And I'm like, what? This was about a year and a half ago. He goes, it's a lot of excitement, you know. People are riding and such. And so me and my friends thought it would be cool and we're heading down there just letting you know. I'm like, don't, no, 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 don't do that, right? Of course he did it. But they had to run out of Seattle. They had to actually run. They abandoned, like took off running because when, when the cocktails started flying, right, they were too close and the police started bearing down. That kind of chaos is the world we share. That's the kind of evil that is around us, church. And no matter, no matter what you think, that's, that's out there. And there's going to come a day where God's going to judge all that. You don't want to be in that crowd on that day. Because the Seattle-Portland scene is going to be the everywhere scene. Make sure you know Christ is your Savior. Because if you're not, you're a son of disobedience. And you're dead. You're hopeless. Jesus sent his, the Father sent His only Son, Jesus to die for all those things. You were dead, but now you're alive. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin in our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We become the righteousness. So I challenge you this, this resurrection day to place your sin on the cross with Christ and he will make you everything you're not. I challenge you to believe in Jesus and the Holy Spirit will come and change your life forever. Now, this is not a cosmic thing. This is not anything to fear. This is just God's gift to you this day. He wants to come into your life and dwell in the temple of your body. He goes with you. He helps you be everything you're not. If we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, He sends what He calls the Holy Spirit a helper and a guide. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to be good. You don't have to get your way to heaven. In one of the books I grew up reading as a child from, it's called My Heart, Christ's Home by InterVarsity Press. Robert Munger talks about the home of our heart. When Jesus enters, he goes from room to room. In the library of our minds, Christ sorts through the garbage, cleaning out that worthless trash. In the kitchen, he deals with our unhealthy appetites and sinful desires. At the dining room, he serves as the bread of life 
to satisfy our hungry souls. And he pours living water for us to drink and never be thirsty again. Through dark hallways and closets, Jesus uncovers all the places where sin hides. He works his way through every nook and cranny until his love, mercy, forgiveness, and grace have filled the space. This allegory presents a beautiful picture of what it means to have the Holy Spirit in us. Is that you today? Is God sweeping the ways of your heart from what you used to be? Or does sin control your life? Because the wage of sin is death. And we've all sinned according to Romans 3.23. We all fall short of the glory of God. But I've got good news for you today. Romans 6.6-7 6 Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is freed from sin. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It just means you know where to put sin. You come back to Jesus and go, I'm sorry. I know I offended you, God. You died for that sin in my life. I don't want it in my life anymore. It's good news to know that Romans 6.23, the wage of our sin is death, but the, the verse isn't over. But there's a free gift, and it's in the name of Jesus that he gives it. It's a free gift of eternal life found in the name of Jesus a majority of Americans describe themselves presently, per surveys, as Christian. Sadly, only 52%, way down from uh, surveys in the past. But the cultural research of Arizona Christian University found this. 52% of people that claim to know Christ think that it's what they do. Their works orientation is what's going to get them to heaven. If they are good enough. Almost half of all adults associated with the Pentecostal church believe that. Mainline Protestants, 44%. Evangelicals, 41%. Churches, as, as well as two-thirds of all Catholics believe it's what you do that gets you to heaven. But I want to tell you on this resurrection day, there's a real problem with that for me. Because it's not what you do, it's what Christ has done. It is for by grace you are saved through belief, through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not of your works, lest any man should boast. It is his workmanship in us. All you have to do is believe, and he will change your heart from the inside out. He will make you everything you're not. Jesus Christ paid it all that day. He paid it all, and one day we get to fly away with him. Because he went to that cross for you. You can't earn it. You can't get there on your own. One of my favorite bands is the band U2, and I, I love Bono, right? Because um, like, he, he spouts out these amazing quotes sometimes. And he says this, You see, at the center of all religions is the idea of karma. You know, what, we, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or in physics, in a physical law, laws, every action is met by equal or opposite one. It's clear to me that karma is the very heart of the universe. I'm absolutely sure of it. And yet along comes this idea called grace to upend all. That as you reap, so you will sow stuff. Grace defies reason and logic. Love interrupts if you like the consequences of your actions, which in my case is very good news indeed because I've done a lot of stupid stuff. But I'd be in big trouble if karma was finally going to be my judge. I'd be in deep S. It doesn't excuse my mistakes, but I'm holding out for grace. I'm holding out that Jesus took my sins onto that cross because I know who I am and I hope I don't have to depend on my own religiosity. Amen. Now, the great theologian Bono, I don't agree with everything he does, but I agree with that. It's not what you've done because if what you've done, we deserve an outcome that's bleak. It's claiming everything that Jesus has done. On this resurrection day, you believe in Jesus' name, you have eternal life today. Amen? Amen. And I want to tell you, it's not like this life. The word life there is life is not here. Life is not, as James 4.14 describes, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, for you're just a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. You're a speck in time. You're 75 years if you're lucky. But what is life? Life is, and this is eternal life from Jesus' own mouth, that, you may, that, I'm, that they may know you, that you're the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's Jesus that gives eternal perspective to life. 
The word life is the word zoe, and it's used in the New Testament as life in an absolute sense. It's not a fading life. It's not an earthly dwelling because we all die. We all are going to run out unless we fly away. But I want to tell you, it's a life that gives you an eternal viewpoint that I don't live for all this. I don't live for what the world can give me. I live for Jesus Christ. Some of you signed up for baptism today and you want to declare that. I want you to go start lining up as I finish my sermon. You're declaring that you have a new life, that you were once dead and now you're buried with Christ. You're identified with Him and resurrected. You're washed clean by His resurrection power. John 10.10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but Jesus, I came so that you would have life and have it abundantly. Do you have abundant life? The word abundantly there is parasos, which means over and above, more than is necessary, super added, super added. Do you have a super added life? Do you have that abundant life where you say, it's more than this. This world can't give it to me all. All you young people here, the world will not be able to satisfy you. When you get more, you'll want to get more and you'll want to get more. It's nothing wrong with being successful. It's nothing wrong with having a good job and provision for your family. But it's when the world has you, when the world is everything you're concerned about, then you're losing sight of where you're headed. That abundant life today, church, is where the greatest vacation you will ever take is when you breathe your last. If you know Jesus, you're going to understand his words when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies... Even if he dies, everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then he ends this to Martha. He says, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this on this Easter Sunday? Do you believe that Jesus is the Yahweh? The I am that I am. I will be what I will be. There's no stopping me. Because I want to tell you, either Jesus is that much truth today Or he's a complete liar. And I want to tell you, there's no way it's not true. He's changed my life. He's changed my heart. He's made me new. He's washed my sins. Like these folks over here, he's given me a clarity that I can't see. Yes, the world is dying around us. Sin prevails around us. Disease, famine. But I don't live for this anyway. I see what he meant when he said, I'm the resurrection and the life. My house will be gone one day. My cars will rust. My kids will... Put me in the ground, I hope, but I'm going to rise again. And I'm not going to say goodbye to him because I'm going to say I'll see you soon, right? Because I don't care what the world brings. I've got kids that have done well and they're doing well and I'm proud of them. They're graduating college, whatever. I don't care about that stuff. I care that my kids and my family and all my friends and all of you, that we continue to do the things we've done the last two years. When the world said, go be fearful, shut it down, we go big. We get on our knees and we say, we're going to work harder. We're going to do more because I have life and life eternal. Do we have that in our lives today? I conclude with this verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. It says, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As the worship band gathers behind me, we have victory today. It's not a sort of victory. It's not a kind of victory. It's complete victory. You can leave here with a changed heart today. All you've got to do is pray with me right now. I'm going to pray for everyone in this room to make an individual commitment to saying it is scary times. There are uncertainties all around me. But I'm going to believe like the thief that chose right today. I'm going to believe that Jesus is my way, my truth, my life, that Jesus is the resurrection and the power, that he's Yahweh God. I'm going to choose him. All the other religions of our world, you know what? They're great prophets. They're great men. They wrote some great books. They're very ethical. But none of them said, I'm God. Jesus did. You believe that today, and that message will change your life. With every head bow and every eye closed, Jesus, I pray that in the silence of this moment, that hearts will be examined as to following you, Jesus. 
that, Lord, you will work right now. That they will hear your still, small voice say, Child, child, I want to be your Savior. Tug at their hearts. If that's you right now, will you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me. Dear Jesus, I needed you to do that. I'm sinful. But thank you that you died for my sins. And thank you, Jesus, that you are alive today. That you resurrected. And Lord, you're alive. And I thank you that you can be my king today. Because you're not a a dead prophet. You're not a dead teacher. You're a risen Savior. I claim that today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head bowed, who prayed that with me? Who prayed? Raise your hand so we can celebrate on this. We're going to have some people in heaven with us today. Amen. Lord Jesus, all glory to you. All praise to you. I thank you for what you've done. We stand now to continue to worship you and to celebrate these in these waters that are proclaiming to follow you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, there'll be some pastors and people that can host you down front. If if you've got something you want to share with a pastor, you need prayer, please come on down. I'll be over to pray with you on that side if you need prayer. Let's stand and worship the Lord together.